Hello everyone. Thursday, March 16th, 11.38 a.m. I want to start a series on the charismatic movements. Um, this is a touchy topic um, and I'm sorry, I am not trying to offend anybody or undermine anybody's faith. Um, and I realize that I do that when I just present conclusions, okay? And so you have to understand, I research for a living, I'm an investigator, I don't really have a whole lot of time to sit here and lay out to YouTube, the YouTube world, how I came to the conclusions that I have come to. Um, but I think in this case, it's important that I do do that um, because there's a lot of hurt feelings on both sides of the aisle. And so the first thing I want to say is the Lord has really blessed me. He has um, he has blessed me in such a way that I, in true investigator form, I'm really able to have an objective approach to these little clicks, if you will, within the church because I'm not attached to any one of them. Um, I'm attached to Jesus in the Eucharist. Like, let's be honest here. So I, I don't like the clicks. I don't like... When people start labeling themselves as charismatic or labeling themselves as traditionalists, I think it, it causes more harm than good. And I have high hopes that our Blessed Mother um, will come straight in all this out. Um, but it's just the nature of what it is. The problem being there's a lot of confusion in the church. There's no, There seems to be a lack of clarity for generations now from Rome. And we have two different masses. And um, so there's just tons and tons of confusion. And so what that means is I personally um, have to be prudent in my approach to my faith. And the way I know how to be prudent is through investigation, investigating things. Um, I don't have some direct line to the Holy Spirit where he comes and tells me things um, and guides me. Unfortunately, I guess maybe as I grow in holiness, that will happen. I don't know. But as of right now, I have to grind it out through research. Um, and I also don't have a clique of trads um, that I'm in with that can, um, you know, confirm me in, in their ways, if you will. So I'm, I'm really pretty much a free agent over here. Um, I, I do lean more towards tradition and that has come through my own, again, my own research, okay? And so I do attend a Novus Ordo Parish um, that does have a charismatic presence. Um, I have been to a healing mass and I know people that have been healed in healing masses. Okay. So I'm not biased either way. And I don't believe the, the charismatic movement is intrinsic, intrinsically evil. I think it leaves a lot to be desired. Um, I don't believe, I believe maybe the only good thing I can see coming out of it is that it's used as a stepping stone to deepen one's faith. Um, or deep in one's holiness and spiritual journey. As for me, I, I won't um, attend any of that. Um, like I said, the healing mass I attended was very early on before I knew what I was doing. Um, and I, it nothing happened to me personally. Um, but it was a normal mass. It was confession, a mass, and then a priest came and prayed over me after, um, after the mass. So I don't know if you would consider that some charismatic um I don't know so I guess and I guess the other thing is there's um a lot of different like flavors I guess of the charismatic movement and it's kind of toned down I would say over the years in the beginning it was a little outrageous um but it's sort of been incorporated I guess into the church in a uh more structured sense I would say um and I do believe that the leadership in the charismatic movements um, did push for that in the beginning to, you know, make sure it was in such a way that it could be considered Catholic. Um, and the reason for that is because it did come from the world of Protestantism. Okay, so it is a Protestant influence within the church. That's not debatable. Those are historical facts. Um, so anybody who says different is lying. And... So what has happened, I think, over the last 50 years or so is it has become, um, you know how the old church used to Christianize the pagan beliefs? Well, this has become Catholicized um, to incorporate more of, I think, Eucharistic devotion and things like that. But at the core of it, the origins of it, we have to look at that, right? Um, if we're going to be prudent in our assessment of things. So... I see it as being, um, like I said, I don't see it as being intrinsically evil. 
I see it as having too many red flags um, to be something that I would participate in. Um, I would feel like I was betraying um, Jesus, to be honest with you, in the Eucharist and in his church, in the sacraments. Um, personally, that's just my personal take. Um, now, I could be wrong about that, but I'm saying what I want to present to you is the research, um, a fair and balanced, because I didn't go into the research into the charismatic movement with some like hatred of the charismatic movements. Um, I have, you know, people I talk to regularly that are charismatics, they're lovely people. Um, but we have to have an intellectually honest conversation about it. Um, if we're going to be prudent in our faith, I would think. So I want to do that now. Um, and so it's not debatable the roots of the movement. Now, again, I'm not talking about the charisms of the Holy Spirit. I'm not, I will get into that eventually, but I want to talk about the actual um, movement. And I would say the avenue to attain these charisms is Protestant. It absolutely is. Um, and again, that's not really deba debatable. Um, so I want to read a little bit about that right now. So just off uh, Wikipedia right quick. Um, Actually, I'm gonna, I'll do the, the peer review published one first. The origins, and this is from ePublishing.com, sorry, EUPPublishing.com. The origins of the Catholic Charismatic Renewal, hereafter CCR, can be traced to Duquesne University in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania in 1967 when two Catholics were baptized in the Holy Spirit. The movement soon spread to the University of Notre Dame, um, Michigan State University and the University of Michigan, all of which became centers of the expanding renewal. Here are the first organizational forms of the movement, such as the Catholic Charismatic Renewal Service Committee and several other organized attempts at outreach, such as the Notre Dame Conferences. Okay, um, so what they don't talk about, though, that I think Wikipedia might pick up on was this weekend retreat. Um, this week, this Duke weekend was a retreat for uh, Duke University students, which um, initiated the charismatic renewal in the Catholic Church. The retreat was held on February 17th through the 19th of 1967 at the Ark and Dove Retreat Center in Gibsonia, Pennsylvania in 1966. Graduate student Ralph W. Kiefer and history professor William G. Story of Duquesne University began using the Pentecost sequence Veni Santi Spiritus to pray for a new outpouring of the Holy Spirit. During this period, they attended or a cursillo and was given two books which describes the experience of baptism in the Holy Spirit, the cross and the switchblade, and they speak with other tongues. Okay, so let's talk about the uh, Cursillo movement. Now, historically, that was, I believe, a movement founded in the 1940s, um, and it was, I believe, Catholic in origin. It had since then, when it came to America, um, was taken for use by the Protestants. So when they say um, they had attended a Cursillo, a Cursillo um, that may or may not have been Catholic, so these were two Catholics, and I believe it was actually a, uh, a Methodist one. I'm not sure. We'll get to that in the next article. Um, but anyway. Um, so in February 1967, Kiefer and Story were themselves baptized in the Holy Spirit um, at an Episcopalian charismatic prayer group. So... Not at the Corsillo, and I, I don't know if it was Catholic. I can't remember what I read on that. I don't think it was, though. I think it was a Protestant one. Um, they Protestantized that movement, actually, is what happened. So you have to be very careful. Um, so, but after that, they attended a another, um, in February of 1967, when they were actually baptized in the Holy Spirit, it was at an Episcopalian charismatic prayer group. Um, so they were actually praying... Um, in this way with, with Protestants. At the time, Kiefer and Story had already been organizing a student retreat, and on account of their experience, they decided to center the retreat on the Holy Spirit. Um, 
Okay, so, and I believe they were actually planning a, a Catholic retreat. But they sought out this whole idea of baptizing in the Holy Spirit um, in order to, I guess, um, succeed in their apostolate. So I think they had good intentions. I think they um, wanted to spread the faith on campus. And I believe they wanted to spread the Catholic faith. Um, and so they had good intentions, but the means for obtaining this um, grace, if you will, to be able to... I guess evangelize is a little questionable. Um, you know, as Catholics, we are told that grace and that strength and gifts and things come through the sacraments. Um, I don't know that any time in church history has it ever been promoted that we should go seek out um, gifts or anything or help through other denominations or other religions. Um, I, I don't, I have a lot of questions about that. Um, that's enough of a red flag for me personally to stay away from that. Um, but other people might have a higher threshold for red flags. Then it describes the account of the retreat. So after they were baptized in the Spirit, they decided to center the retreat, their, I guess their Catholic retreat, on the Holy Spirit. And this is an account of what happened. One of the retreatants, Patty Gallagher Mansfield, described the Saturday night of the retreat as follows. Saturday night, a birthday party was planned for a few of our members, but there was a listlessness in the group. I wandered into the upstairs chapel, not to pray, but to tell any students there to come down to the party. So that's interesting to me. Um, I mean, maybe you should let people pray in the chapel rather than trying to distract them with a party. I don't, that doesn't seem, that seems interesting to me. But anyway, no, nonetheless, yet when I entered and knelt in the presence of Jesus in the blessed sacraments, I literally trembled with a sense of awe before his majesty. I knew in an overwhelming way that he is the king of kings, the lord of lords. I ran down to tell our chaplain what had happened, and he said that David Mangan had been in the chapel before me and had encountered God's presence in the same way. Two girls told me my face was glowing and wanted to know what had happened. Within the next hour, God sovereignly drew many of the students into the chapel. Some were laughing. Now, I believe they're talking about an adoration chapel. Some were laughing. Others crying. Some prayed in tongues. Wow. I have never seen anything like that in my perpetual adoration chapel at my church. Um, in fact, it's quite the opposite. Um, there's signs everywhere saying to be quiet. <laughs> um, some are like, okay, so others like me felt a burning sensation coursing through their hands. One of the professors walked in and exclaimed, what is the bishop going to say when he hears that all these kids have been baptized in the Holy Spirit? Yes, there was a birthday party that night. God had planned it in the upper room chapel. Many of the students, including Mangan, reported speaking in tongues that night in the chapel. Kiefer sent the news of the retreat to the Catholics at the University of Notre Dame, where a similar event soon after occurred. And the baptism in the Holy Spirit began to spread. For example, by March 1967, Ralph C. Martin, a leader in the Corsillo movement, had become among the earliest beneficiaries of the uh, Duke's Gnay weekend and went to become a major leader in the Catholic charismatic renewal. Wow. Interesting account. Um, take it for what you want. Okay. So then we have, all right, we have that. Now let's see what the charismatics actually have to say. Because they link it to a Catholic... Um, Kind of a Catholic source, if you will. An outpouring of the Holy Spirit brought about by the Pope is what they link it to. Um, and I have some issues. I have some issues with that. Um, I, I do. I have a lot of issues with it. 
So let's see, this is from, I don't even know, catholicfaith.com. And actually, I want to go a little bit more in depth here before I do that on something else I came across. All right. So this is Catholic culture. I want to give a little history on Pente um, the Pentecostal origins here. Because this is um, very, we, we see this behavior a lot in the, the Protestant world prior to this retreat happening. So classical Pente Pentecostalism, from which the Neo-Pentecostalism of the Charismatic Renewal derives, is essentially a form of fundamentalist evang evangelical Protestantism and has derived much of its substance from the Methodist revival movement of the 19th century. The movement, dubbed the Holiness Movement, was an effort to revive the Wesleyan doctrine of entire sanctification. This took the form of a distinct second blessing, which conferred the gift of total interior conversion, enabling the recipient to lead a life of genuine moral perfection. This second blessing manifested itself as re at revivals as an often intensely emotional experience of a purely subjective nature. The term baptism in the Holy Ghost was used by some preachers to describe this experience echoed in the contemporary analog baptism in the Holy Spirit. A distinction should be made, however, in so much as charisms did not accompany the holiness experience. So that's interesting. The birth of Pente um, Pentecostalism is attributed to one Charles F. Parham, a former holiness preacher, master and founder of the Bethel Bible School in Topeka, Kansas. The presumed date of the birth of the movement is said to have been January 1st, 1901, and was an outcome of Faram's teaching uh, meth methodology, which was quite simple. Using the Bible as a sole textbook, an appropriate question would be introduced to be answered through the study and researches of his students. As fate would have it, Parham posed this question, what is the scriptural sign of a true baptism in the Holy Ghost? The conclusion gleaned from the pages of Acts speaking in tongues. Several days and nights of prolonged prayer prepared the enthusiastic students for the coming of the Holy Ghost. On January 1st, 1901, Agnes Osnam, a Bethel student, requested that Parham lay hands on her head while the group of students fervently prayed. Agnes is recounted as a result of this to have spoken Bohemian as well as several other languages. Within days, this phenomenon had been experienced by all the students and the movement was truly born. It is essential to note from the aforementioned episode the dramatic theological shift in the concept of baptism in the Holy Ghost as, an, as originally understood within the context of the holiness movement. From this point on, most classical Pentecostals would subscribe to the notion that tongues must accompany the baptism in the Holy Spirit in order to authenticate the genuine bestowal of power given from the effective witnessing to Christ. Okay. Um, it is unnecessary to recount the phenomenal growth of the various Pentecostal denominations which arose from Faram's modest experiment. By 1925, there were some 38 denominations in the United States alone. In recent expansion within the past few decades outside of the United States, it has outstripped other denominations in its phenomenal rate of growth. What is necessary to note is that the neo-Pentecostal outbreak of the last few decades was the direct cause of the parallel phenomenon which attained to such gigantic strides within the Catholic Church that Bishop McKinney of the U.S. expressed in the early days of the renewal to attend at least half a dozen prayer meetings before making a decision either to reject it or participate in it. This direct casual relationship exists in evidence in the conception of the Catholic Charismatic Renewal Movement. This occurred in the spring of 66 when doctors William Story and Ralph Keller, lay faculty members at the university, having been disappointed in their apostolic endeavors and influenced by Keller's reading of John Shearer's They Speak in Other Tongues, sought out a means whereby they might be filled with the gifts of the Holy Spirit after the manner of the early apostles. This led to participation in several neo-Pentecostal prayer meetings held in a Pittsburgh suburb in the hope that they might learn how to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. After attendance at several meetings, two of the four attending Catholics requested that hands be laid on them and they then began to undergo 
the Pentecostal experience of speaking in tongues. The experience was shared with a group of Catholic students on retreat in February of 1967, from which the first Neo-Pentecostal group was formed on a Catholic campus. From there, the movement spread to Notre Dame and beyond. So I have some issues here. I have a lot of issues here. Um, and so now we shall read the other side of what the Charismatics um, say. They say it actually did not come from the Protestant world. And I'm talking about the movement. I'm not getting into yet the theology of all this. I'm talking about the actual social movement here on earth, if you will. Um, they point to the fact that so if you remember in the, in the last article I just read, January 1st, 1901 was the date in which that girl down in Topeka, Kansas started speaking in tongues, right? So they'll point to that and actually say that was brought upon um, this whole movement, therefore was brought out or called down, if you will, by Pope Leo the Thirteenth, And that's a very big claim. So I think we should investigate that. Um, so here's what a, a brief synopsis of what they say. The charismatic renewal of the present day has its roots in the 19th century. Between 1895 and 1903, Blessed Elena Guerra, uh, G-U-E-R-R-A, I guess it's Guerra, the foundress of the Oblate Sisters of the Holy Spirit in Italy, wrote 12 letters to Pope Leo XIII in which she asked him to encourage greater devotion to the Holy Spirit among Catholics. As a response to her request, Pope Leo XIII published an encyclical about the Holy Spirit called Div uh, Divinum Illud Munis in 1897. He also urged the church to pray the Novena for Pentecost at the beginning of the new century. So, we're going to read that encyclical in a minute. But what did Pope Leo urge the faithful to do to, in order to have great greater devotion to the Holy Spirit. Pray a novena. Hmm. A novena is a prayer said for nine days, which recalls how the early Christians prayed for nine days between Christ's ascension and the coming of the Holy Spirit on Pentecost. Early 20th century. The 20th century was highlighted by a Pentecostal revival shared within the Protestant community. Hmm. These events at the start of the charismatic renewal are important for uniting individual believer, believers in the global church. On January 1st, 1901, Pope Leo XIII prayed to the Holy Spirit and sang the Veni Creator Spiritus by the Holy Spirit window in St. Uh, St. Peter's Basilica. On the same day at the Bethel College and Bible School in Kansas, the Holy Spirit came upon a group of Protestants who had been praying to receive the Holy Spirit just as the early disciples did. One of the students, Agnes, started speaking in tongues, a miraculous experience often considered the first of its kind at that time. More and more people started welcoming the Holy Spirit to come to them through miracles, deliverance, and gifts of evangelization. Now, we're going to read Pope Leo XIII's encyclical, parts of it, not the whole thing. And we're going to see that nowhere does Pope Leo XIII advocate that people pray to and welcome the Holy Spirit to come to them through miracles, deliverance, or other gifts of evangelization. And so here's where we need to make a distinction between gifts of the Holy Spirit and charisms of the Holy Spirit. To me, um, at this point in my research, it was pretty, there's a, a case was forming in my head that there was pretty good evidence that the true outpouring of the Holy Spirit had been hijacked. The true outpouring um, in devotion to the Holy Spirit, true devotion to the Holy Spirit in, in a truly Catholic sense, prayed for by Pope Leo XIII and urged by a holy nun, might have been hijacked. And I'm going to tell you why I think that. Because the charismatics of that time, I'm not saying all of them, just I'm saying the movements. If they were, re okay, so why is their, their movements, why is it called 
the charismatic movement and not the gifts of the Holy Spirit movements because they focus on what this is saying. They focus on what the Protestants were focusing on, which was the speaking in tongues, the prophecy, the healing, the outward manifestations. But that's not what Pope Leo was praying for, y'all. He was praying for devotion to the Holy Spirit and asking to increase the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit. So it seems to me that there has been somewhat of a cheap hijacking and that this new Pentecost, if you will, has yet to be fulfilled. And I believe it will. And I believe it could be even being fulfilled now, but not in the way that the charismatic groups are trying to make it seem. Not through prophecy, not through um, all these extraordinary manifestations. It's an inward increase in the gifts of the Holy Spirit in the souls and the hearts of men. It's dangerous. It's dangerous to start associating these things with encyclicals and it's dangerous. So more and more people started welcoming, okay, I already read that. Um, the revival of the Pentecostal experience continued in the lives of many people for decades. Pope John Paul, um, I, I think, I'm not sure if they meant Pope John Paul II. They put Pope John Paul the 23rd, so it's either John the 23rd or John Paul II prayed for a new Pentecost um, in 1962. So that would have been, uh, I guess, I don't know which Pope that would have been. Just as Pope Leo the 13th prayed for a great outpouring of the Holy Spirit in 1901 to prepare for the Second Vatican Council. I think they're confused here. I don't, maybe this isn't a good one. Pope Leo the 13th prayed for God to renew his wonders in the present day through a new Pentecost. The second Vatican council emphasizes the importance of the universal call to holiness and Jesus's call for every Christian to live to the fullness of the Christian life and to the perfection of charity. The council also taught that it is Jesus who gives both the call and the ability to fulfill it because it is Jesus who sent the Holy Spirit upon all men. Okay. So, um, an office for the charismatic renewal was established in 78 as a response to the growing need for guidance that came with the rapid growth of the movement. It is known today as the International Catholic Charismatic Renewal Services and is re responsible for promoting a culture of Pentecost throughout the church. Now, I think wherein lies the issue for me, the definition of what a new Pentecost is supposed to look like. And in order for us to understand that, we have to go back to the source who they're saying is Pope Leo the 13th who initiated this whole devotion and this whole calling for a new Pentecost. So that's exactly what we're gonna do right now. We're gonna go to him and then we are going to read about the Holy Nun and the um, thing that she composed, the prayer that she composed. And I think you're going to see that it's not the same as what it is, um, as the, the, the charismatics, um, make it out to be, uh, it's really a cheap knockoff is what it is. I'll be honest to me. Sorry if I'm offending people again, but I'm telling you exactly why I have come to these conclusions. So he does write, um, I'm not going to read it all. He writes about, I'll link it so you can read it for yourself. But the two principal aims of the pontificate, the Catholic doctrine of the Blessed Trinity, the Holy Ghost and the Incarnation, the Holy Ghost in the church, and the Holy Ghost in the souls of the just is what I want to read. And on devotion to the Holy Ghost. Okay. So... And, and keep in mind, so Pope Leo is encouraging true devotion to the Holy Spirit. Not in the way, and what did he say? He urged the faithful to pray a novena. He did not urge the faithful to go to a Pentecostal service and ask to pray in tongues or be baptized in the Holy Spirit. That is not at all what Pope Leo the Thirteenth meant, as far as I can see. Um, it's crazy. Like, what? How can you... You can't even compare the two. Um, so here he talks about the Holy Ghost and the church. And he really talks about how the Holy Ghost, its, it's operation in the church is um, to set forth the magisterium. So let's read that. 
the church which already conceived came forth from the side of the second Adam in his sleep on the cross, first showed herself before the eyes of men on the great day of Pentecost. On that day, the Holy Ghost began to manifest his gifts in the mystic body of Christ by that miraculous outpouring already foreseen by the prophet Joel. For the paraclete sat upon the apostles as though new spiritual crowns were placed upon their heads in tongues of fire. Then the apostles descended from the mountain, as St. John Christosom writes, not bearing in their hands tables of stone like Moses, but carrying the spirit in their minds and pouring forth the treasure in the fountain of doctrines and graces. Thus was fully accomplished that last promise of Christ to his apostles of sending the Holy Ghost who was to complete and, as it were, to seal the deposit of doctrine committed to them under his inspiration. I have yet many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. But when he, the spirit of truth, shall come, he will teach you all truth. John 16, 12 through 13. For he who is in the spirit of truth, insomuch as he proceedeth from the Father, who is the eternally true, and from the Son, who is the substantial truth, receiveth from each both his essence and the fullness of all truth. This truth he communicates to his church, guarding her by his all-powerful help from ever falling into error and aiding her to foster daily more and more the germs of divine doctrine and to make them fruitful for the welfare of the peoples. And since the welfare of the peoples for which the church was established absolutely requires that this office should be continued for all time, the Holy Ghost perpetually supplies life and strength to preserve and increase the church. I will ask the Father and he will give you another paraclete that he may abide with you forever, the spirit of truth. By him the bishops are constituted, and by their ministry are multiplied not only the children, but also the fathers, that is to say, the priests, to rule and feed the church by that blood wherewith Christ has redeemed her. The Holy Ghost has placed you bishops to the rule, to rule the church of God, which he hath purchased by his own blood. And both bishops and priests, by the miraculous gift of the spirit, have the power of, of absolving sins according to those words of Christ to the apostles, receive ye the Holy Ghost, whose sins you shall forgive, they are forgiven them, and whose shall retain, you, they are retained. That the church is a divine institution is most clearly per, um, proved by the splendor and glory of those gifts and graces with which she is adorned, and whose author and giver is the Holy Ghost. Let it suffice to state that, as the Christ is the head of the church, so is the Holy Ghost her soul. What the soul is in our body, that is the Holy Ghost in Christ's body, the church. This being so, no further and fuller manifestation and revelation of the divine spirit may be imagined or expected. For that which now takes place in the church is the most perfect possible and will last until the day when the church herself, having passed through her militant career, shall be taken up into the joy of the saints triumphing in heaven. So he's talking about um, the miracle of priests being able to forgive and absolve us of our sins and um, the infallibility of the church and all these, these are miracles. Uh, they are. And I know that we kind of take them for granted as Catholics, but they're miracles. The Holy Ghost in the souls of the just. The manner and extent of the action of the Holy Ghost in individual souls is no less wonderful, although somewhat more difficult to understand, inasmuch as it is entirely invisible. Hmm. This outpouring of the Spirit is so abundant that Christ himself, from, who, from whose gift it proceeds, compares it to an overflowing river, according to those words of St. John. He that believe in, believeth in me, as the scripture saith, out of his midst shall flow rivers of living water, to which testimony the evangelist adds the explanation. Now this he said of the Spirit, which, that, which they should receive who believeth, who believeth in him. It is indeed true that in those of the just who lived before Christ, the Holy Ghost resided by grace, as we read in the scriptures concerning the prophets, Zachary, John the Baptist, uh, Simeon, and Anna. So that on Pentecost, the Holy Ghost did not communicate himself in such a way as then for the first time to begin to dwell in the saints, but by pouring himself uh, forth more abundantly, crowning, not beginning his gifts, not commencing a new work, but giving more abundantly. 
St. Leo the Great homily um, three. But if they also were numbered among the children of God, they were in a state like that of servants. For as long as their heir is a child, he differeth nothing from a servant, but it is under tutors and governors. Moreover, not only was their justice derived from the merits of Christ who was to come, but the communication of the Holy Ghost after Christ was much more abundant. Just as the price surpasses in value, the earnest in the reality excels the image. Wherefore, St. John declares, As yet the Spirit was not given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. So soon, therefore, as Christ, ascending on high, entered into possession of the glory of his kingdom, which he had won with so much labor, he um, munificently opened out the treasures of the Holy Ghost. He gave gifts to men. And he quotes Ephesians um, 4, 8. For that giving or sending forth of the Holy Ghost after Christ's glorification was to be such as had never been seen before, not that there had been none before, but it had not been of the same kind. And that's St. Augustine. Human nature is by necessity the servant of God. The creature is a servant. We are the servants of God by, na by nature. On account, however, of original sin, our whole nature has fallen into such guilt and dishonor that we had become enemies to God. We were by nature the children of wrath, Ephesians 3. There was no power which could raise us and deliver us from this ruin and eternal destruction. But God, the creator of mankind, and infinitely merciful, did this through his only begotten son, by whose benefit it was brought about that no man, or sorry, that man was restored so that rank and um, that man was restored so that rank and dignity whence he had fallen and was adorned with still more abundant graces. No one can express the greatness of this work, work of divine grace in the souls of men. Wherefore, both in Holy Scripture and in the writings of fathers, men are styled regenerated new creatures, partakers of the divine nature, children of God, godlike, and similar uh, epithets. Now these great blessings are justly attributed as especially belonging to the Holy Ghost. He is the spirit of adoption of sons, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. He fills our hearts with the sweetness of paternal love. So the, look at, um, listen to the language of what Pope Leo is describing, okay? So he's talking about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And they're not, he's not talking about the charisms. And that's the major issue. Um, they somehow have gotten lumped together or something weird. And, and the charismatic movement really does put too much of an emphasis on what's not as important. Um, so that th that's the danger with it. Again, I'm not saying charism somehow aren't um, given by the Holy Spirit. I'm not saying that. I'm saying... Um, I'll just finish reading Pope Leo. This is what I'm saying. Okay. He, so he is the spirit of adoption of sons whereby we cry, Abba, Father. He fills our hearts with the sweetness of paternal love. The spirit himself giveth testimony to our spirit that we are the sons of God. This truth accords with the uh, similitude observed by the angelic doctor between both operations of the Holy Ghost. For through him, Christ was conceived in holiness to be by nature the Son of God, and others are sanctified to be the sons of God by adoption. This spiritual generation proceeds from love in much more noble manner than the natural, namely from the untreated love. The beginnings of this regeneration and renovation of man are by baptism. And he's talking about not he's talking about normal baptism with water. In this sacrament, when the unclean spirit has been expelled from the soul, the Holy Ghost enters in and makes it like to himself. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. The same spirit gives himself more abundantly in confirmation, strengthening and confirming Christian life, from which proceeded the victory of the martyrs and the triumph of the virgins over temptations and corruptions. We have said that the Holy Ghost gives himself. The charity of God is poured out into our hearts by the Holy Ghost who is given to us. For he not only brings us brings to us his divine gifts, but is the author of them and is himself the supreme gift who proceeding from the mutual love of the Father and the Son is justly believed to be 
and is called Gift of God Most High. To show the nature and the efficacy of this gift is to is to well to recall the explanation given by the doctors of the church of the words of Holy Scripture. They say that God is present and exists in all things by his power, insofar as all things are subject to his power. By his presence, insomuch as all things are naked and open to his eyes, by his essence, insomuch he is present to all as the cause of their being. But God is in man, not only as inanimate things, as in inanimate things, but because he is more fully known and loved by him, since even by nature we spontaneously love, desire, and seek after the good. Moreover, God by grace resides in the just souls in a in a temple, sorry, in the just souls as in a temple in a most intimate and peculiar manner. So intimate and peculiar. From this proceeds that union of affection by which the soul adheres most closely to God, more so than the friend is united to his most loving and beloved friend and enjoys in all fullness and sweetness. Now this wonderful union, which is properly called indwelling, differing only in degree or state from that with which God beatifies the saints in heaven, although it is most certainly produced by the presence of the whole blessed Trinity, we will come to him and make our abode with him. And that's John 23. Nevertheless, it is attributed in a peculiar manner to the Holy Ghost. For what wilt traces of divine power and wisdom appear even in the wicked man. Charity, which as it were, is the special mark of the Holy Ghost, is shared in only by the just. In harmony with this, the same spirit is called holy. For he... The first and supreme love moves souls and leads them into sanctity, which ultimately consists in the love of God. Wherefore, the apostle, when calling us to the temple of God, does not expressly mention the Father or the Son or the Holy Ghost. Know ye not that your members are the temple of the Holy Ghost who is in you, whom you have from God. The fullness of divine gifts is in many ways a consequence of the indwelling of the Holy Ghost in the soul's of the just, for as St. Thomas teaches, when the Holy Ghost proceedeth as love, he proceedeth in the character of the first gift. When, so we're talking about, again, I want to just remind people, we're not talking about charisms. We're talking about the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit. When um, Augustine with that, through the gift which is the Holy Ghost, may other special gifts are, many others Special gifts are distributed among the members of Christ. Among these gifts are those secret warnings and invitations. Secret warnings and invitations, which from time to time are excited in our minds and hearts by the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. So he's talking about a very inner um, manifestation of the Holy Ghost accompanying gifts, such as um, special gifts that are distributed among the members of Christ. Again, among these gifts are those secret warnings and invitations, which from time to time are excited in our minds and hearts by the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. Without these, there is no beginning of a good life, no progress, no arriving at eternal salvation. And since these words and um, admonitions are uttered in the soul in an exceedingly secret, there's that word again, secret manner, they are sometimes aptly compared in holy writ to the breathing of a coming breeze and the angelic doctor likens them to the movements of the hearts, which are wholly hidden in the living body. Thy heart has a certain power and therefore the Holy ghost who invisibly vivifies and unites the church is compared to the heart. More than this, the just man, that is to say, he who lives the life of divine grace and acts by the fitting virtues as by means of faculties, has need of those seven gifts, which are properly attributed to the Holy Ghost. By means of them, the soul is furnished and strengthened, so as to obey more easily and promptly his voice and impulse. Wherefore, these gifts of such efficacy that they lead the just man to the highest degree of sanctity, and of such excellence that they continue to exist even in heaven, though in a more perfect way. By means of these gifts, the soul is excited and encouraged to seek after and attain the evangel um, evangelical beatitudes, which, like the flowers that come forth in the springtime, are the signs and the harbingers of eternal 
uh, beatitude. Lastly, there are those blessed fruits enumerated by the apostles in Galatians verse 22, which the spirit, even in this mortal life, produces and shows forth in the just. Fruits filled with all the sweetness and joy in so much as they proceed from the spirit, who is the trinity, the sweetness of both father and son, filling all creatures with infinite fullness in profusion. The divine spirit, proceeding from the father in the word, in the eternal light of sanctity himself, both love and himself both love and gift after having manifested himself through the veils of figures in the old testament poured forth all his holiness upon christ and upon his mystic body the church and called back by his presence the grace of men oh sorry by, by his presence and grace men who were going away in wickedness and corruption with such sol solitary effect that being no longer of the earth earthly earthy they relished and desired quite other things becoming of heaven heavenly on devotion to the holy ghost these sublime truths which is so clearly which so clearly uh, show forth the infinite goodness of the holy ghost towards us certainly demand that we should direct towards him the highest homage of our love and devotion Christians may do this most effectually if they will daily strive to know him, to love him, and to implore him more earnestly, for which reason may this, our exhortation, flowing spontaneously from a paternal heart, reach their ears. Um, perchance, there, oh, sorry, perchance, sorry, some of these words, perchance there are still to be found among them, even nowadays, some who have asked, as were those of old by St. Paul the Apostle, whether they have received the Holy Ghost, might answer in like manner. We have not so much as heard whether there be a Holy Ghost. At least there are certainly many who are very deficient in their religious practices, but their faith is involved in much darkness. Wherefore, all preachers and those having care of souls should remember that it is their duty to instruct their people more diligently and more fully about the Holy Ghost avoiding. However difficult and subtle controversies and eschewing the dangers, dangerous folly of those who rashly endeavor to pry into divine mysteries. What should be chiefly dwelt upon and clearly explained is the multitude and greatness of the benefits which have been bestowed and are constantly bestowed upon us by this divine giver, so that errors and ignorance concerning matters of such moment may be entirely dispelled as unworthy of the children of light. We urge this not because it affects a mystery by which we are directly guided to eternal life and which must therefore be firmly believed, but also because the more clearly and fully the good is known, the more earnestly it is loved. Now we owe to the Holy Ghost, as we mentioned in the second place, love because he is God. Um, okay, so thou shalt love the Lord God with all thy hearts. Um... The love has a twofold and most conspicuous utility. In the first place, it will excite us to acquire a daily, to acquire daily a clearer knowledge about the Holy Ghost. For as the angelic doctor says, the lover is not content with the superficial knowledge of the beloved, but striveth to inquire intimately to all that um, appertains to the beloved, and thus to penetrate into the interior. Interior. As is said of the Holy Ghost, who is the love of God, that he searcheth even the profound things of God. In the second place, it will obtain for us a still more abundant supply of heavenly gifts. For whilst a narrow heart contracteth the hand of the giver, a grateful and mindful heart causeth it to expand. Yet we must strive that this love should be of such a nature as to not consist merely in dry speculations or external observances, but rather to run forward towards action and especially to fly from sin, which is a more special manner offensive to the Holy Spirit. For whatever we are, that we are by the divine goodness, and this goodness is specially attributed to the Holy Ghost. The sinner offends his benefactor, abusing his gifts, and taking advantage of his goodness becomes more hardened in sin day by day. Again, since he is the spirit of truth, whoever faileth by weakness or ignorance may perhaps have some excuse before Almighty God. But he who resists the truth through malice and turns away from it sins most grievously against the Holy Ghost. In our day, this sin has become so frequent that those dark times seem to have come, which was foretold by St. Paul, in which men, blinded by the just judgment of God, should take falsehood for truth and to believe in the prince of this world, who is a liar and the father thereof is a teacher of truth. 
God shall send them the operation of error to believe lying. In the last times, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to spirits of error and the doctrines of devils. But since the Holy Ghost, as we have said, dwells in us, as in his temple, we must repeat the warning of the apostle. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed, nor is it enough to fly from every sin. Every Christian ought to shine with the splendor of virtue, so as to be pleasing to so great and so beneficent a guest, and first of all with chastity and holiness, for chaste and holy things befit the temple. Hence the word of the apostle, uh, know you not that you are the temple of God. Um, for the temple of God is holy, which you are, a terrible indeed, but just a warning. Lastly, we ought to pray to and invoke the Holy Spirit for each one of us greatly needs his protection and his help. The more a man is deficient in wisdom, weak in strength, born down with trouble, prone to sin, so ought he there more to fly to him who is the never ceasing fountain of light, strength, consolation, and holiness. And chiefly, that first requisite of man, the forgiveness of sins, must be sought for must be sought for for from him it is in the special character of the holy ghost that he is the gift of the father and the son now the remission of all sins is given by the holy ghost as by god by the gift of god concerning the spirit the words of the liturgy are very explicit for he is the remission of all sins how he should be invoked is clearly taught by the church who addresses him in humble supplication calling upon him by the sweetest of names Come, Father of the poor, come, giver of gifts, come, light of our hearts. O best, best of counselors, sweet guests of the soul, our refreshment. She earnestly implores him to wash, heal, water our minds and hearts, and to give to us who trust in him the merit of virtue, the acquirement of salvation, and joy everlasting. Nor can it be in any way doubted that he will listen to such prayer. Since we read the words written by his own inspiration, the Spirit himself asketh, for us with unspeakable groanings. Lastly, we ought confidently and continually to beg of him to illuminate us more daily and more with his light and flame us with his charity. For thus inspired with faith and love, we may press onward earnestly towards our eternal reward. I think this part's worth repeating. How he should be invoked is clearly taught by the church. Who addresses him in humble supplication? Calling upon him by the sweetest of names. Come father of the poor. Come giver of gifts. Come light of our hearts. Oh best of consolers, sweet guests of the soul, our refreshment. She earnestly implores him to wash, heal, and water our minds and hearts, and to give to us who trust in him the merit of virtue, the acquirement of salvation and joy everlasting. Okay, um, so we are clearly given um, some guidance here. We are clearly given um, what Pope Leo XIII had in mind when he was in trying to inspire a devotion to the Holy Spirit. He's first and foremost concerned with the actual gifts of the Holy Spirit, okay? And so let's actually, I'm going to look at that right quick. Um, okay. Because I think it's important. I've gone over this before, but... The seven gifts, this is from Catholic Answers. The seven gifts of the Holy Spirit are according to, Catholic, according to Catholic tradition, wisdom, understanding, counsel, fortitude, knowledge, piety, and fear of God. Okay. Um, these gifts, according to Aquinas, are habits, instincts, or dispositions provided by God as supernatural helps to man in the process of his perfection. They enable man to transcend the limitations of human reason and human nature and participate in the very life of God as Christ promised. Aquinas insisted that they are necessary for man's salvation, which he cannot achieve on his own. They serve to perfect the four cardinal or moral virtues, prudence, justice, fortitude, and temperance, and the three theological virtues, faith, hope, and charity. The virtue of charity is the key that unlocks the potential power of the seven gifts, which can and will lie dormant in the soul 
after baptism unless so acted upon. And so the, um, the charismatics use this to say that's why you need baptism in the spirit um, because they're lying dormant in the soul. Because grace builds upon nature, the seven gifts work synergistically with the seven virtues and also with the 12 fruits of the Holy Spirit and the eight beatitudes. The emergence of the gifts is fostered by the practice of the virtues. The emergence of the gifts is fostered by the practice of the virtues, which in turn are perfected by the exercise of the gifts. The proper exercise of the gifts in turn produce the fruits of the spirit in the life of the Christian. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, modesty, self-control, and chastity. The goal of this corporation among virtues, gifts, and fruits is the attainment of the eightfold state of the beatitude described by Christ in the Sermon on the Mount. Okay, um... This is interesting. Po Ironically, post-Vatican II catechesis has proven even less capable of instilling in young Catholics a lively sense of what the seven gifts are all about. Yeah, and so what we see here is a lot of confusion, like I said. Um, but anyway, I just wanted to point that out. I'm not gonna, I said I wasn't going to get into the theology. I wanted to point out the origins. There's one more thing I want to talk about because they brought up and this is right off Renewal Ministry. So this is Ralph Martin, Mr. Charismatic himself. Um, and I think he has a lot of...